May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please take a seat. <coughs> so one of the uh, analogies that's drawn between John and Jesus is that of apologetics and evangelism. So um, apologetics is, is the art and skill and discipline of explaining the reasonableness of the Christian faith. A lot of people think it sounds like an apology. It's like, oh, I'm sorry I'm a Christian. No, no. <laughs> but there is a link. Have you ever been running late for something? And when you no. get there, <laughs> no, I, mean, I know you haven't, Cheryl, but um, you, might, you might have had people experience this around you. And um, what you do, that, what happens then is when you get there, you apologize. And usually there's some sort of explanation that's connected to that. Like, uh, I'm sorry I'm running late. Uh, the traffic was terrible. It's not a good excuse from Bundy, but anyway, uh, <laughs> traffic's nothing here. Um, so that's sort of, it's the explaining part. And so you can see why they draw the links between John the Baptist and Jesus. So event, uh, apologetics prepares the way so that people are open to hearing about God. And then evangelism is sharing the good news, telling about God and sharing so that they experience that. And I like that. I like that because the, the idea of, sort of preparing, the, preparing the ground for the seed to come. I'm not always convinced of apologetics, though. Um, have you ever had someone do this to you? They've apologized for something. And in their apology, they've made the thing all about them. You know, it's like, oh, I'm sorry I couldn't come to your birthday party. I was climbing Mount... Everest, and I was at the peak at the time. You don't care that you weren't coming to my birthday party, you don't. <laughs> anyway, sometimes the explanation takes away from the apology, doesn't it? And I, I think that's the case sometimes with apologetics. It actually takes away the power of the gospel. And, and don't get me wrong, I can do apologetics with the best of them. I, I, I love me a good argument. Um, there's a thing about engineers, you know, don't argue with an engineer, it's like wrestling a pig. After a while you realise not only are you not going to win, but the pig's having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> Arguing with clergy is much the same. It's just, it's, it's, it's just, fun. It's just so much fun for us. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I can do that. I, um, but I have to ask this. If we spend so much effort talking about the reasonableness of Christianity, we lose some of its... How? Because Christians believe some crazy stuff. We believe some really crazy stuff. We believe that the God who is the source of all existence loves us. That's crazy. I mean, if you think about it, the entire universe, He cares about you and me. That's crazy. That's just nuts. And if we explain that away, it takes some of the craziness away from it. I mean, and it's not the only crazy thing we believe. I, we have this phrase that we use, Christ crucified. That's crazy. I mean, we use it so often, we don't think it's crazy. We think it's normal, but it's not. God with us got turfed out of the city and killed. Brutal. That's, that's just mind-blowing. We are followers of Jesus who died and three days later changed his mind. That's crazy! If we explain too much of it, we take away its power. We take away its power to make people go, there's something different here. It goes beyond reason. It goes into the space where God is good and kind and loving and generous. Where God seeks life even for those who, under normal circumstances, would be feeling shut out from that. And I want to come back to the birth of John. In those days, uh, the value of a, of a woman was very closely tied to the number of sons she had. Because 
they thought boys were more important than girls. And I was just I, I was sort of thinking about this this morning. Can you imagine a scenario these days where the mum says the child's name is John and they go, oh, we better check with dad first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dad's not going to argue. <laughs> Dad's not going to go, oh, I don't like that name. How about we give him something of a different... No. <laughs> Mum said the name just... But back then, it's like, oh, no, no, we better check. It's like, no one in your family's got that name. We better check with Dad first. <laughs> but this, this is, uh, that's culturally nuts, but anyway. And so they go, they check with, check with Zechariah, and he writes out, his name is John, and then he can speak. You remember, he, he couldn't speak because he couldn't believe. He couldn't speak because he couldn't believe, and when he came to accept, then he could speak. But that's kind of the linkage there. Uh, if you remember the sort of backstory to, the, to John. So here's the craziness. John means God is gracious. God is gracious. Now grace is not just like the, the, the prayer we say before supper or dinner. Grace is the overflowing goodness of God. It's the space that God creates for us where despite or perhaps even because of our brokenness we are accepted and given space to heal. Grace is an incredibly powerful gift that God pours out. It's not something we've earned, it's not something we deserve, it's not something any of us have earned or deserved. It is the overflowing love of God experienced. It's that space where we might heal and know wholeness. And John's <coughs> name means God is gracious. And that's crazy. But it's also good. It's up to us to experience the grace of God and to then proclaim it in the world. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.